Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the latest City University of London European Social Survey and NatSEN webinar. My name is Eric Harrison. I'm Deputy Director of the European Social Survey, Eric, at HQ. Today, we've got three fantastic speakers from the UK Office for National Statistics, Laura Wilson, Emma Dickinson, and Colin Bevan Seymour. Going to be talking about responded, uh, respondent centered design. So, without further ado, I hand the floor to Laura. Cool. Okay, so hi everyone, welcome to our talk. Um, I'll begin, well, Emma and I'll begin by providing a brief background to the method, and then um, Colin will also come in later on and we'll step through some examples and case studies of the problem space and how you can use RCD to help tackle that. So, I'll start by introducing the method. So we created the term respondent centre design to represent an amalgamation of best practice methods from two industries. So they are social research and user experience design, which is where um, user centred design hails from. Both skills are required in order to develop easy to use surveys that produce high quality data. So user centred design is not a new methodology or approach. It has existed in the computer technology industry since the 1980s. And a quick Google search on the term will return over 47 million results. So you can see it's, it's not new. Um, UCD is also not a build it and they will come mentality. In fact, it's the complete opposite. Instead, it is where users of a service or product, for, for example, for us, that would be respondents, are firmly put at the heart of the design process by building to meet their needs. The user's needs are established through research, which focuses on exploring their habits, thoughts, questions, behaviours and expectations. Um, and those insights are then used to inform and drive each step of the design of a service or project. And for us again, that would be a survey. So this needs based development ensures that the service or product remains user centred and is not built based on assumptions. It also means that if you learn about the needs of the people who will be using what you develop, then they are more likely to use it and use it without issues. So the key thing to be aware of and remember when it comes to respondent centred design is that you are not the user. And by this, I mean that you are often developing something for other people to use and possibly interact with. Therefore, the design of that thing should not be informed by what you think is the right thing to do. Instead, it should be informed by those who it's actually intended to be used by. Um, and for us, again, that's the respondent using the survey. In the survey world, an example of when we make ourselves the user is when we do at desk design a little research with actual respondents. And doing so means that what is developed is highly likely to be based on assumptions that you and others hold about the respondent and their needs, rather than being based on actual insights. For example, when you hear, I think respondents would prefer, or I think a respondent will select X, then you know you aren't making decisions based on evidence and insights. An assumption-led design will always result in the wrong thing being produced. Instead, what you should be hearing in any design discussion is, our research shows, or a participant did X, so we should build Y. Uh, these are genuine insights and they are gathered through research exercises with the public to establish their needs. These needs then drive the design and the content. So I'll now pass over quickly to Emma to introduce the respondent centred design framework. Thanks Laura, I'll just take control of these slides. Can you confirm they've moved on because I get paranoid? Yes. Thanks. Um, so we've been working in this sort of respondent centred design way since about 2016 now. Um, it's been a learning curve for us um, and over the time we've sort of created and refined a framework to assist us um, and hopefully to assist others as well to redesign in an RCD way. Uh, funnily enough, we've called it the respondent centred design framework or the RCDF for short. Um, it really sort of combines social research best practice with the aspects of the usability research that have come in in recent years. Um, it's used within the agile delivery method um, and I'll just talk a little bit about the sort of 10 components of the RCDF now um, and then just talk a little bit about the sort of practical application within that agile context. So the first component is to gather the data user need um, as although we're sort of promoting putting the respondent user first it is obviously nonetheless important that the data that we collect meets that data user requirement. So it doesn't mean that the data user requirement or the need takes priority over the respondent user need, um, but it's just an awareness really that you can meet sort of both sets of needs simultaneously through this good RCD sort of design. It's really important at this stage that we try and avoid our stakeholders and data users attempting to design questions for us. Uh, often they have an idea about how a question should look or what words should be used. Um, and those words might relate to words used in policies or by experts, for example, 
but actually that might not be understood in the same way as our respondents understand things. So what we actually need to do is gather the data user requirement and then put the, the onus on us as survey designers to meet those requirements. Um, and we do that using the insights we'll gather during the process I'll just describe now. So one of the first things you do is understand mental models um, associated with the sort of topics that you're going to be trying to measure. So these are an explanation of how a person sees the world, um, how they understand things around them, what their thought processes are. It's typically things, you know, if you're trying to measure um, people in employment, you might have start to try and understand uh, what people think about when they think about the word paid job, for example. And that might be more uh, complex or more unique or broader than you might originally um, think um, when you're designing the questions. So it's these insights that really direct the build. Um, they should be gathered before you start to design any questions or any content. And we learn about them by carrying out qualitative user research typically. So your in-depth interviews and your focus groups, for example. And it's these mental models that help us to understand the respondents' experiences and their needs. You can use them to create respondent stories in their journeys, um, which can be used as key reference material as you're designing your survey. So it's the stories and journeys that really help you to ensure that you're designing in a respondent centered design way, because basically for each decision or design feature, you can ask yourself, what need is this meeting? Much like um, Laura mentioned just a second ago. Um, if that question is difficult to answer, you might actually be designing based on assumptions. So as Laura said, things like, um, I think the respondent might want this, for example. So the respondent story is a three part statement um, that documents the respondent's needs and why um, they're currently, com sorry, commonly written as you see on screen here. And then the journey um, documents each step and task completed by the respondent when going through your process. You should use the insights gathered from the sort of early research alongside other relevant or available qualitative or quantitative data. So that might include typically um, looking through the journey um, of a pre-existing questionnaire if you have one to look at efficiency, to look at um, where respondents might having um, to be completing sort of unnecessary tasks or unnecessary questions that might make their experience more burdensome because it might lead to disengagement. You can also use analytics. Um, you can look at power data if you have any, for example, um, drop off points or timestamps, for example. And it might give you some insights about what questions might be difficult or burdensome. And you can also use the qualitative data, of course. Um, it's a fantastic source of insights. So your focus groups, again, your cognitive interviews really help you understand um, your users and their needs. Uh, one of the large respondent needs is appropriate tone, readability and language. And that's our component number five. Um, if these aspects aren't done optimally, generally your user receives a poor experience. Um, they might feel that the content is unrelatable, that it's off-putting. Um, at ONS, or uh, particularly in our work, we generally create content that's quite um, conversational in nature. We typically ask ourselves, how would I speak to a friend about this? Because it relates um, to what they're used to, it's relatable content. That said, it's really important to note that it is sort of context specific. So, for example, if you're sending out um, emails to remind people to complete your survey, that might need to be of a stronger tone. Um, so it depends on the context. But it's really about consistency as well. So in your tone, in your language, across your sort of touch points, because that's what creates legitimacy and confidence through the whole sort of end-to-end -end journey. When questions fall down, um, the common reaction is to add guidance or help text, um, but we advise not to do this. Uh, the problem is that people just don't read it. Um, in fact, what we find in survey design is people often don't even read the question stem. They just go to the response options, try and deduce what's being asked of them. And only when they uh, are confused, they'll go to the question stem. Um, and guidance really comes quite far down the list in terms of attention. So actually, as well, what we're doing there is we're putting the onus on the person providing the data to get it right, whereas actually what we should be doing is doing the hard work to make it simple for them. So that might mean breaking down the question um, stem or the response options or even breaking the topic up into sort of multiple easier questions. Component seven is to take an optimized approach. So that means creating bespoke content for each mode um, because it provides a better respondent experience and improves data quality. And then you test across all modes to check um, universal understanding. So essentially you're checking that although the question wording or the presentation might not be the same across the modes, the data that you get back ultimately is. 
We then use adaptive design during development. So that means that the layout uh, adapts to the screen size appropriately. We design for mobile screens first and then larger ones. Um, that's because it really sort of helps challenge us to think about what the minimum content needed is. And then we justify each piece of content being added thereafter, um, referring back to those user stories and journeys um, and needs to do that. And then once we have designed, we test our content and our questions through cognibility testing. It's a, a term we've sort of coined. Um, it combines methods used in traditional social research, um, so your cognitive interviewing, with techniques from the user experience world, so usability testing. And we combine the methods because it's really important to understand how the physical aspects of the survey might affect the comprehension um, to response um, of the answers, basically, and vice versa. And then last and by no means least is to design inclusively. If we don't do that, we risk excluding certain groups and compromising our data quality. So accessibility and inclusivity um, really should be thought about from the start of the design process rather than as a sort of afterthought or nice to have. Um, so as I just said a minute ago, we use the RCDF alongside the Agile delivery method um, and there's different sort of activities associated with uh, each phase. So, for example, during discovery, you'll focus on the components and um, you can see they're in purple and that's all about gathering insights from multiple different avenues. So that um, just to really hammer it home begins before you design anything, before you build anything. So that might um, include speaking to interviewers if you have them on uh, pre-existing surveys, listening into those interviews, um, running in-depth interviews with your respondents, um, really beginning to gain information on mental models. You can also look at the existing data to really consider those uh, respondent journeys. And then once you've done all of that, you can then start to analyse and to create your supporting documentation. So your respondent needs um, stories and journeys. And it's those that then will help you prioritise what you develop um, and the next steps that you take. So you then move on to alpha um, and that's where you begin to build and test your questionnaire content and you'll focus more on, on more of the sort of RCDF components there um, really building on your understanding of those mental models and the experiences. And you should design with the RCDF components in mind, so um, not relying on guidance, using appropriate tone, for example. And then we really recommend that you get out and start testing, which is um, generally the fun bit. Um, we recommend you do that as soon as possible because the sooner you test, the sooner you learn, the sooner you learn, the sooner you know whether a design is, is really working or if it needs a redesign. Um, we do also recommend that testing be as true to life as possible um, and also focus on what works, not just what respondents like, because that doesn't always translate into action. And then after testing, you can analyse, redesign and go again um, and do the sort of um, discovery and alpha in a cyclical manner. Um, so I'll just now hand over to Laura to show how this actually can be put into practice. If you're talking, you're on mute, Laura. Oh, sorry, thank you. <laughs> I was going to happen at some point, wasn't it? Um, yeah, so I'll just talk uh, briefly about how we can get uh, respondents to open the letters using respondent centred design. So when it comes to doing research into respondent communications, these are the relevant parts of the RCDF that we followed, um, and they were all critical to the success of the strategy and the products that we created. In particular, using the mental models that Emma talked about, and then also using the um, creating with appropriate tone and readability and language were really essential as well. So we followed Agile delivery and developed and tested the materials through many phases and activities, both qualitatively and quantitatively. For example, we used a mixture of traditional and not so traditional methods, some of which um, I talk about next. And the cognibility testing, which is them as described the combination of the cognitive and the usability testing, um, that was used for the letter to questionnaire journey and that was really critical to the, to the success of the products that we created. <clears throat> so just to say, some of you may have seen this research before, but it's important to share in order to provide context. Um, and as we heavily invested time and money into this research, all of the products are still in use today, which shows that they are still effective all these years later. So something that was new for ONS was that we conducted a lot of barrier-based research for this comms work. 
And by that, I mean, we explored what the barriers to response were and what we could do to design um, or do with, sorry, design to eradicate or minimise them versus just concentrating on creating a really good letter. So barriers start much earlier in the respondent journey than we usually think of. Um, an example of a barrier is the envelope and we need to do some research into getting um, into getting the envelope open before we could get the letter content to be followed. After all, there's no point having a great letter if no one gets to read it because they choose not to open the envelope in the first place. So although this research itself was not strictly respondent centred in nature, it actually went on to help um, give the RCD letter content the best chance of being read. So we did two things. Firstly, we introduced an intriguing incentive, which was the tote bag. So not many people know this, but being an incentive was a secondary purpose of the bag. Its main purpose was to encourage the respondent to open the letter as it was bulky and intriguing, and we dubbed this the squishy effect. We also used um, and introduced behavioural insights into the envelopes. This included regional branding for Wales and Scotland, but not for England, based on our research, um, and a nudge strap line that said, make sure you're counted. The results from our research showed that with a tote bag, um, we ran a pilot in 2017, which showed that the tote was more cost effective than a five pounds incentive with a marginal difference in response. Um, I, sh I share a link to this at the end of, of the talk. But more recently, sadly, during the period around the Queen's funeral, internal discussions about the appropriateness of sending envelopes with on Her Majesty's service on them, um, unfortunately led to a dispatch delay. <clears throat> This meant that we were unable to package the tote to meet the dispatch deadlines and as a result we observed a nine percentage point drop in response when the bag was not included. So this really shows the value and the impact of the squishy effect. Um, with the BI research, again in 2017 we tested the envelope designs. The branding appeared to have a positive impact on response in Wales, although the difference wasn't statistically significant. The same impact wasn't seen in Scotland, but it was very marginal um, and there's no cost barriers to adding the designs on the envelope, so we decided to pursue, um, pursue those in both countries. But more research is needed in this space. So now moving on to the respondent centred work. So once the letter was opened, we then needed respondents to read it and then action it. So all of the content for the letters was fully informed by respondent needs, which were initially um, identified in the discovery work and then later validated in the alpha phase testing. So it's important to note that none of the content was based on our views of what should be featured. And this was the first time that ONS had created fully respondent centred content and it took many rounds of rounds of research and a variety of research methods to develop them. <clears throat> In the research, we explored order and flow, comprehension, tone, needs and assurances. Um, we made sure that any content we designed and took out for testing met the average reading age of the UK, which is nine years old. We also ensured that we recycled the respondents' words and phrases into the content to make it relatable and easy to understand. So we ran three unconventional tests alongside more traditional research. The first one was the Goldilocks and the Three Bears test. So this is where we um, used focus groups to explore respondent mental models around the tone of voice for ONS. So we took out three letters. One was very formal, one was quite neutral, and one was quite familiar in tone. Uh, we learned that a very formal tone was off-putting and intimidating to respondents. The familiar tone was said to not sound like government. Um, and then it was the natural, uh, the neutral tone, sorry, that resonated most with respondents. And we ended up going with that one. The second test was the Frankenstein, Frankenstein test. Um, and this is where we ran workshops with the respondents to explore order and flow of the letters. So we already knew from previous research that the body of the letters fully met respondent needs in terms of the content. But what we didn't know was the order and flow that the information needed to be presented in. So therefore, we cut up the letters into sections and asked participants to create their own letter using the different sections in order to create a respondent centred product. The third test was the highlighter test, um, and this was a remote post out test where we validated respondents needs and cognition as a refresher exercise. So, you know, once you create these products, it's really important that you go back and you retest them a few years after to make sure they're still relevant. So we sent participants packs with three different coloured pens um, and our communications. Uh, and then we then assigned a colour uh, to each task in the sub pack. We then asked participants to highlight what they thought was important, what they thought they needed in order to be able to do the survey online and then what they did not need to know. So as you can see, the respondent was fully embedded in our research programme. All of this research amongst other work was not um, has not been shared today, but it all resulted in a more streamlined and pertinent comm suite for the respondents. This then helped them to not only understand why they should do the survey, but also how and in turn this helped us to achieve our survey goals. So I'll now pass back to Emma. 
Oops, just take control back. OK, so I'm just going to talk through an example which shows how the response centre design has improved our questionnaires. So whereas Laura's example was very colourful and very bright, this is going to be a, a numbers heavy um, example for you. So just a bit of background uh, first to this. So a few years ago, we were looking at transforming a set of um, key labour market questions for a labour market survey. So the work was based on the pre-existing labour force survey, the LFS, which um, some of you may have heard of. It's a um, huge longitudinal household survey run here at ONS um, in terms of sample. It's one of our biggest. It began in uh, the 1970s. Um, it's the UK's largest continuous monthly social survey. And it's been added to many times over the years, um, but without much in the way of, I suppose, a, a sort of holistic review and update. Um, we wanted to transform that survey into a prototype survey instrument um, designed to uh, gather alternative labour market statistics. So the first thing we did at the start of the project was to gather the data user requirements. Um, and that determined that a key data user need was uh, to determine somebody's employment status. So largely that's whether they're employed, um, whether they're unemployed or whether they are economically inactive. So they are uh, students, for example. Um, because we had that pre-existing survey, the LFS, we wanted to make sure we were using that data and using the insights that were available to us um, to really inform our development process. So we therefore began with our discovery phase and we were looking at the current flow, flow through that questionnaire. So what we wanted to establish was whether that flow was optimal. So uh, what did the respondent's journey look like? Did they have the shortest route to classification and sort of therefore the out of the survey? What sorts of questions did they meet? Um, in what order did they meet them? And to do that, we needed to look at the data of people and their journeys. So this is what we found, um, and I'll talk through this a bit slowly. Like I say, it is a bit numbers heavy, um, but hopefully it demonstrates quite neatly the sort of flow that people have. So it's a very simplified version of the block of questions, um, and it shows that there's a, a few ways in which the respondent could be classified. So they could be on a government training scheme, um, they could be in employment, they could be an unpaid family worker, for example, doing some unpaid work for their own business or family member's business. They could be unemployed or they could be economically inactive, so um, basically not seeking or not available for work. And the original questionnaire flow uh, went a bit like this. So in the data set, um, a quarter's sample was uh, just shy of 73,000 uh, respondents who were drawn into the sample and they begin the survey. So the first question asks of the respondent, were you on one of these government training schemes, essentially? And that identifies and classifies about 200 respondents. So we still have over 72,500 respondents in the survey, um, but it's asked, that question is asked about all of them. Um, it's therefore quite a burdensome and, and fairly irrelevant for the vast majority um, of respondents in terms of a question. So these just over 72,500 are then asked, did you do any paid work in the reference week? which categorises quite a big proportion, so just under 45,000 respondents as being in employment, um, which leaves us with uh, 27,700. They are then asked, well, did you do any unpaid work um, for a business that you own or a business that your family owns? And that identifies about 200 people. So we've still got 27,500 people in the questionnaire or in the survey. We then ask them, um, OK, well, have you been looking for work in the last four weeks? And if so, would you be able to start uh, a job within the next two weeks? And that identifies about two and a half thousand people. We've still got 25,000 people in the survey at this point. They've seen multiple questions now. Um, we know they're not looking for work. We know they're not able to start. So we classify them as economically inactive. Um, but we are still interested in um, their reasons for that inactivity. So are they, as I said before, students? Are they retirees? Are they um, long term disabled or stay at home caregivers? Um, and so we classify 25,000 people to economically inactive. So that's about 34 percent of the sample that are classified last. Now, the respondents in the inactive categories are probably able and probably eager to tell us their situation right from the beginning and um, to save themselves um, and interviewers, um, because this is an interviewer led um, survey originally. Um, save them the burden of asking multiple questions, uh, which are not really relevant to them. So what you can see here is this just isn't respondent centred. Um, and actually, if we consider the respondent experience, we can do better. So once we had this information, um, we had sight of a potential problem. 
we then undertook some more discovery activities to really give us a better understanding of the respondent experience um, and to start really understanding those mental models. So um, one of the first things we did was to hold insight sessions with our interviewers. Uh, we watched and listened and learned um, by shadowing them in some of the interviews that they were running. And actually one of the main frustrations we heard um, from both the interviewers and respondents um, was just stating that the existing questionnaire was quite repetitive for some. So, for example, um, our retirees, they kept saying at multiple questions, um, I'm retired, I'm retired, yep, I'm retired, um, and it wasn't relevant for them. And our interviewers essentially had to respond with, I'm sorry, but I need to ask these questions, please bear with me. So this is giving both users, both the respondent and the, exper the experienced interviewer, um, a really poor experience uh, and could essentially impact on respondents' willingness to take part not only in this survey, um, but also in future surveys run by ONS or future waves of this survey. So simply, I mean, the flow of the questionnaire um, just obviously wasn't working. Um, the research really clearly demonstrated how important it was for a respondent to have a journey that felt logical and felt relevant. It made them feel valid um, and it made them feel that their contribution was worthwhile. It also would have given them confidence that they'd answered correctly um, because they're being presented with questions that make sense to them. Um, all of those things are really important in any mode, uh, but in an online mode, it's really critical because if we fail to create the right flow, um, that means respondents see irrelevant questions like they are here, and that can lead them to think that they've answered a previous question incorrectly. It can lead to confusion and frustration and then ultimately drop off. So those insights that we gathered uh, from our interviewers alongside the data we had really showed us that the current design just wasn't working. Um, it wasn't respondent centred. So we went about changing it, essentially. We knew we needed to design in a way which meant we were meeting the principle of doing the hard work um, so the respondent didn't have to. Um, and for this example, that meant transforming the questionnaire flow so that essentially the largest proportion of respondents had the shortest journey. So we reorganised the flow and did some work there um, and it now works like this. So we still have 72,800 respondents going in. But the section now opens with a question about whether they did any paid work in the reference week. Um, and if they say no, the answers are followed up with a question just to check they weren't um, away from a job. So typically um, employees like uh, teachers who might be on school holidays, that kind of thing. And if they say yes, they're followed up um, by asking them if they're an employee or self-employed. And that categorises those almost 45,000 respondents um, pretty much straight away. That accounts for over half the sample and leaves just shy of 28,000 left in our survey. They're then asked if they have been looking for work, uh, followed by those questions around whether they'd be able to start. Um, the majority of these respondents are not in paid employment, so they're either economically inactive or unemployed. Um, we deal with the economically inactive group next because they comprise most of the remaining sample. So 25,000 respondents are classified there. And at that point, we can really start asking questions to understand the reasons for, um, for why that is. So whether they are retired or a student, for example. That leaves about 2,900 respondents. Um, if they're actively looking for work and they're available to start, they are then defined as unemployed. That classifies around um, 2,500 respondents. And that leaves just 400 in our sample. And then finally, the last 200 uh, family workers and 200 respondents on a government training scheme are then classified. So it was those individuals that were originally classified really early in the flow, um, but now they're left to the end, essentially. And when you look at the original and transformed flow side by side, um, I'm hoping it's quite easy to um, see the difference. So remember the figures in blue, um, or rather green there, are the numbers of respondents at each stage of the questionnaire, um, and red is the number of respondents who are being classified out, essentially. So uh, after we did this redesign of the flow, we cognitively tested the questionnaire, and actually we no longer saw the frustrations that we had originally witnessed. Um, and added to that, the interviewers were really glad to see the changes we had made as well, because it made their lives easier. And because the flow had been improved um, and was less burdensome for both the response and the interviewers, we were able to add in some complexity as well. So we could ask questions about both main and second jobs for those respondents who were working, for example. So the effect of that redesign, um, it meant that respondents saw fewer questions before they were classified and moved on, um, either to the next section or uh, out of the survey. 
They also saw better ordered and more relevant questions. Um, that meant they were able to answer with better accuracy because um, they aligned with to their mental models. Um, because of that, they had more confidence in their response, um, which led them to feel like their participation was um, valid and it was useful um, because they could see themselves in the survey, essentially. That meant less burden, uh, less item missing missingness, a better experience of the survey, um, which also then would need to uh, lead to sort of less attrition, both within the survey itself and then between the waves, as I said earlier, or um, for other surveys that we might run. And in addition to that, our interviewers had a better experience as well because they weren't on the receiving end of that frustration um, felt by the respondent. That means that their job satisfaction uh, hopefully increases and hopefully uh, we'll see less um, also rather see more increased job retention um, and less uh, staff turnover. Uh, when we actually tested this, many of our uh, interviewers said, you know, when can we start using this version of the survey? So they're all um, really keen uh, to do so. So these are all sort of really large positives from a fairly minor piece of work. Um, and now I will just hand over to Colin uh, to talk about how some of these things have really started to come out now in um, some of our trials and testing. Great, thanks Emma. Um, just check I can the slide. There we go. Okay. So um bring together all of the RCDF content that Laura and Emma have talked about uh, has provided an overall increase to data quality um, on the labour market survey that Emma mentioned earlier. Uh, and we know that from the, the qualitative uh, and quantitative testing, we were able to you know see distinct improvements with each one of these stages so as a whole obviously it increases um data quality but each individual stage of the rcdf has got a noticeable increase so in the context of the labor market survey as emma mentioned this is a new survey which is based on concepts that are measured by the labor force survey um, it's multi-mode so a digital by default we invite every household to take part online as a starting point and for those households that don't take part online, we try to follow up by telephone um, where we have a phone number for them. And if we, we can't get um, a contact by telephone, we then do knock to nudge, which is something that we launched in November 2022. And this involves an interviewer visiting a household um, and attempting to get either an, a telephone response, as in a telephone number, so we can do a telephone interview or persuade them to take part online. It's a longitudinal design similar to the labor force survey so there are five waves in total um, on the labor market survey and we have a large wave one sample of 142,000 households per quarter so it's a huge sample 568,000 per year um, and this covers great britain and northern ireland as well so um, we launched the what we termed the beta of the lms in April 2020. So this followed on from some of the, the pilot studies and the discovery work that uh, Laura mentioned earlier. We did the, the test that Laura mentioned in 2017, and then we did a follow-up test in 2018, where we brought together all of that learning from the previous tests and all of the user engagement with the tote bags, the envelopes, the content, etc. Um, and we did what we termed a statistical test. And this was the first time we got to see whether or not the transformed labour market survey was fit for purpose and that um, you know going back to the the core concepts of labour market um, you know make sure that was understood by users in a quantitative um, a quantitative test um, and to compare it to some of the results from the you're already running a labour force survey um, and we found some really encouraging results from that um, so we followed it up with another test in 2019 which looked at longitudinal data. So we followed households up, I think it was a sample of 50,000 households, and we followed them up for uh, two subsequent waves. And this involved uh, more RCDF learning where uh, we use between wave engagement in the form of um, emails and, and postcards to test if there were things we could do to in increase engagement between the waves and retain people as we went along. And we found from that testing that um, an email was a, a cost effective and you know effective in terms of response um it was good at keeping people in the survey so we had some plans to do like a longitudinal um testing which was more statistically focused um but as we were planning that we 
obviously uh, got into the COVID period. And that was when in April 2020, we were asked to launch the, the LMS longitudinally online only um, as a backup source of data in case the labour force survey um, couldn't be conducted because it relied on interviews visiting households. Obviously, that wasn't possible during the pandemic with lockdowns. Um, so we launched as a, as a backup and then we've been continually running since then. Um, we've been going through a series of transition phases, which is like milestones, key milestones in the survey. So like I said, we launched the knock to nudge back in November. Um, before that, we had a transition state where we launched additional content that was in July. And then before that, in the February 2022, we launched the telephone mode. Previously, it was an online only survey. Um, we've got other things that are, that are planned in. Uh, we've got a parallel run, so we'll be running alongside the Labour Force survey and comparing the, the statistics from both to see you know, where we're matching up and where we're not matching up. Um, and we're going to do some more end-to-end -end user journeys uh, where we'll be following households and individuals all the way through the stage from you know the initial point of receiving the materials and opening the letter through to the end of the the longitudinal journey for them and then there'll be other small scale ad hoc research um, efforts that we do along the way so examples of how the rcdf has helped so with interviewers um, i think it's already been mentioned you know interviewers are users too um, and we need the questionnaire and all the supporting materials to be as clear, accessible and relevant as possible. So the interviewers often rely on um, you know, some of the selling points for the service of so the tote bag being one. It's a good sort of reminder point for households who say, oh, I didn't receive any materials. Then you can point to the tote bag as you know, you would have received a tote bag in the post. It jogs their memory. Yes, I just forgot to do it or I didn't really understand. And then the interviewers can step in then um, and persuade the, the household to take part. So like Emma said as well, having fewer interviewer instructions um, is always helpful for them because they spend a lot of time having to not just talk about the question, but to talk about instructions that might not necessarily be relevant to a household. Um, and it, it does break up the flow of the questionnaire quite a lot as well. So the whole principle with the RCDF to make it a more relatable and understandable um, you know, concepts for, for the respondent themselves also applies to the interviewers. There's much more conversational in tone the way the questions are asked. It also helps um, to reduce training and documentation as well. So with existing surveys, interviewers often have large help guides um, which document, you know, not just the instructions on individual questions, but you know the, the purpose of the surveys and uh, context around why there might be different checks in the survey to ensure data quality and uh, coherence and things like that but by making the flow better by reducing those instructions by making it more conversational understandable going back to those core concepts that we're trying to measure and doing that qualitative work to make sure that people and households understand what they're being asked. It means that that documentation that the interviewers have to either carry around or access is greatly reduced. We have a minimal set of instructions now for interviewers. And by being able to replicate this across multiple surveys, which is something that we're planning on doing in the future, this will reduce the amount of training that's needed for interviewers as well. So it could be a bit more generic across the surveys. Um, you know, if you're if you're trained in the the kind of the core concepts in the labour market survey, then that could be applicable across other surveys as well that either replicate the same principles or the same sort of questions. With the survey inquiry line, this is like the, the first point of contact that um, a respondent would have with ONS if they phoned in um, to ask you know, various questions about the survey. So because we've got a large sample on the LMS, we do get a high volume of calls just because of the nature of the sample being larger. But the RCDF has meant that the nature of the queries has changed. So we get fewer calls relating to the purpose of the survey because that's explained very clearly in the letters. Obviously, we do still get some, but it's much reduced because of um, you know, all of that work that's been done to explain why people should take part and what's in it for them. Um, and that relates to the, the, the how to take part aspect as well. It's very clear on the on the letters how somebody can access the survey online. And if they can't do it, then they can they can phone up and try and make a telephone appointment as well. 
and we have fewer calls relating to specific questions as well so where we would get households who would phone in and be um, either stuck or couldn't understand certain questions on some of the other surveys, then again, this is greatly reduced on the LMS because of just how coherent and clear a lot of that content is. With programming and processing the questionnaire, so some of the, the, the back end work, the complexity of the routing is greatly reduced. So like Emma said, the the Labour Force survey has been running for decades now and the questionnaire gets added to and added to and added to and um, this is in comparison to the Labour Market survey which is kind of like a fresh start so in that great example that Emma gave um, with that you know the, the flow of the questions within that initial Labour Market block because it's much more clear it's almost like you know you go from point A to point Z rather than you know going bouncing about a lot like you would in the Labour Force survey it means that the the complexity of the routing is greatly reduced and it means that the questionnaire the programming behind the questionnaire is much cleaner and much more logical uh, and this obviously makes it easier to detect any mistakes or make changes we have fewer checks on the survey as well so by checks i mean um like interventions that would be put in automatically where somebody's uh, put in data that might not fit logically so we have two categorizations of checks we have hard checks which is where somebody just cannot proceed past a point in the survey because they've given an incorrect answer and we have soft checks which are things where maybe the data looks incorrect but it could still be correct it just doesn't look typically like um, the data should but we've greatly reduced these down we have very very few checks in the questionnaire now and this removes one of those barriers um that that respondents would have so you know you get to a situation where somebody's entering their data which is correct from their perspective but they can't proceed through the questionnaire because the programming is telling them they can't do it because there's something that doesn't look logical although in their mind it is correct so by rationalizing the questionnaire um, and doing all that qualitative work working with the respondents to understand all of those sort of situations we have very very few checks in the questionnaire and also the questionnaire flow means there's no back and forth between the topics so you don't have to go backwards and forwards through the questionnaire it all flows through logically you answer the questions about the labor market then you do education then about benefits things like that it all flows through logically it's much more um it's much less painless much less painful i should say um and you know this applies to both the respondents and the interviewers who were conducting the questionnaire as well so in terms of research evidence, um, we've seen higher response rates. So currently we get around about 40% response rate across the UK at wave one on the labor market survey, um, which we're really happy with. Um, that knock to nudge uh, data that I started to talk about in uh, that happened in November, that hasn't really flowed through yet. So we should get a few percentage points on top of that soon, but currently and pretty much consistently it's been 40%. Um, and we've been able to see that as the RCDF content has been implemented, we've seen a continual increase in that response rate. So when we did that very first test that Laura talked about in 2017, we got 19.5%. And that was the first real go at um, sending letters to households to see what sort of response rate we would get from an online survey. Then as we've iterated on that, we made the evidence-based improvements, mainly from the the qualitative work but then from the quantitative work to back it up changing those envelopes the branding um the content of the letters the frequency of how often we send the letters as well so how many reminder letters we sent we started with one we increased that to two reminder letters we decreased it back down to one now because you know the evidence suggested that that second reminder didn't really um, boost response but all of those things and the ongoing work that we're doing is pushing that response higher and that is you know we it's measurably um down to the rcdf in terms of the data quality so i can't talk about anything really specific at the moment um you know because of things not having yet been published but in general over the course of 2022 so from say february through to about october 2022 on the labor market survey the new survey um we're seeing higher proportions of non-white non-british respondents taking part um 
previously so in sort of 2020 2021 when we were when we launched the beta of the lms um the predominant demographic in the online uh, responding you know households were um over 45s white british homeowners um, and through some of the work that we've been doing over the last year, we've been able to increase the proportion of non-white, non-British respondents in the survey, just increasing representation. Um, we've seen higher response rates from more deprived areas as well. So looking at the index of multiple deprivation, deciles are one to three, so the, the, the more deprived third of, of, um, of that classification, we're seeing higher response rates coming through and the, um, the, the differential, the range between the more deprived areas and the less deprived areas is shrinking down. We're getting a more consistent response. It's not perfect yet, but you know, we're getting there. And again, this is down to the RCDF and, um, you know, the accessibility of the letters and, um, you know, why people should take part the, the better understanding of what's in it for for different households we're seeing better response rates from the harder account households or using some census classifications um that classify each household into a hard account index so there's a there's a general hard account as in households that don't tend to take part in um government systems and services so you know ones that don't use um digital methods to you know, renew their passport or to uh, do their car tax or renew um, driver license, things like that. Um, and looking at that, we're seeing improved response rates from what are termed to be hard account households as well. So again, that's been going up over the last couple of years. And I think something that's probably primarily down to the online mode, which is the, the primary mode of the survey, is we're seeing more consistency in response as well. So some of that seasonal variation that we tend to get, um, particularly over the December and January collection periods when you know there's holidays for the Christmas period and the New Year period, um, traditionally surveys tend to see a bit of a, a dip in response there. But um, on the labour market survey, it seems to be more consistent. So we don't get a large drop in response. Again, I think that's down to the online mode and the convenience um, for households to be able to take part um, at their leisure but um, you know that's something that again is increasing the data quality because when we talk about reference periods for um, for employment statistics we're not seeing a dip in um, some of the more traditional times of year. So in conclusion how does RCD help? Well the, it all starts with the design so if you've got the better design it's easier to use and to understand better respondent experience reduces the respondent burden and it means that people are going to stay in the survey so when we're doing the longitudinal survey if the respondent experience is, is poor then they're not going to take part in in the later waves we need to keep them in that longitudinal data is really important so by giving a better respondent experience it encourages them to stay in and with the labor market survey we don't just have the longitudinal data for labor market statistics. Um, we also subsample into other surveys. So there's an opinion survey um, that runs every few weeks and some uh, respondents, some households from wave one of the labor market survey are invited to take part in the opinion survey as well. So getting that user experience right at the start, is obviously vital to make sure that they take part in the later waves as well. Better measurement means we get more accurate data, and I think this is really at the core of things from a from a quantitative perspective. Having those measurements, making sure that people are answering questions that they understand, that they they can comprehend, um, it increases the the quality of the data. It makes it more accurate. We then get better response rates from that, um, which means we get more data with a bit less effort. But it's not all just about the response rate. It's also about the, you know, the, the inclusion and making sure that we're getting households that don't typically take part in social surveys or don't take, typically take part in online first surveys. Um, and this is down to the operations as well. We can be more efficient and responsive, which means we can devote more time and effort towards trying to get data um, from harder to reach households. Better representation, so there's less editing and imputation, um, and that is really important as well in terms of the data processing. We obviously we get a larger volume of data in through, um, you know, through having a larger sample size as well. But by having the 
that kind of clarity of the data, fewer other responses or write in responses because people are, you know, better able to classify themselves within within the data structure it means that we have less editing to do, less imputation to do because there's less missing data as well. And all of this together leads to better data quality, uh, which means that hopefully everybody will be happy with all of the stuff that we've been doing. So that's the end of the presentation. Now we've got some uh, links and resources um, in the slides, which I think will be circulated. So it's got some links to the RCDF guidance that Laura's talking about, some previous webinars um, and some of the research publications that have been done um, by ONS over the last few years. So thank you everybody. Um, and I think Eric, it's over to you for any questions. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so if you would like, we have time probably to take two or three concisely posed questions. So if you want to put them in the chat, I will take them from there and put them to our speakers. Uh, thanks so much uh, for that talk. It was uh, very, it's very relevant to a lot of the things that obviously ESS is doing at the moment as we move towards a transition to self-completion. I also really liked it for the um, for the extension it's made to my vocabulary. So I'm going to be using cogability and squishy effect uh, at every opportunity I get. Um, I've got like um, just a, a small point. You made the point very forcefully about the importance of uh, taking into account the uh, the feelings and the experience of of the survey respondents and sort of balancing that with your other stakeholders who are the data users. Have you done any exercises in sort of any sort of co-production where both groups of stakeholders have actually been represented in some way in the same room when discussing these kind of things? We haven't done that, but what we have done is shared the recorded sessions with the stakeholders where we've been trying to move them to acceptance of, of certain changes that we're proposing or, or even just to kind of share the evidence and share the progress in the work and that was really effective so we definitely recommend that. Okay. Thank you. Okay so uh, now questions flowing in. Uh, is the ONS thinking about using RCD for any crime surveys? I can pick this up if that's okay. Um, so yes, they are. We are using it for the crime survey. Um, so that is being transformed at the moment. So there's some work going on um, in the discovery phase, um, picking up some previous counter work that's been done as well. So that is actually happening. Super. Uh, is there any work being carried out to look at communications that invite respondents via email, not just in between survey? Um, I can pick this one up. So. Um... Not at the moment. Um, I think one of the one of the barriers is because it's a household survey. So if we send it to an email address, then it'll probably just be to one individual within the household. So sending a letter to a household increases the chances that at least one person in the household is going to see that. Um, but that's not to say that isn't something we would want to do in the future because you know it would reduce. Um, you know the frequency of posts that we'd have to send out and it would reduce the cost as well and obviously it's a bit more um like eco-friendly not be sending as many letters out so that's something we'll be looking at i think possibly the opinion survey might do invites by email but that's because it is an individual survey rather than a household one so i would say it's not something we're doing at the moment but it is something that we probably will be looking at okay um any use of RCD for children's surveys? No, we haven't done it, but would be super interesting to, to try at some point, but not, not within ONS at the moment. OK. Uh, in your discovery research, have you consulted users about their interest in receiving feedback about the results? Do you provide such feedback to form participants and so forth? Um, I not directly we do for the between way of engagement so that um email is like a thank you email which also includes some relevant statistics from the previous quarter to show how the respondents uh, data contributed towards some of the labor market outcomes so we do it with the between way of engagement but i don't think we do anything formally um you know to write back to respondents to say 
you know, this, these are the results. But that's something again that we we can look at. OK, and a question from the Q&A that I just picked up. Uh, find it interesting, uh, Laura's finding about tote bag tote bags being more effective. Uh, have you tested other non-monetary incentives? So there's a trial due to happen with a notepad potentially as an alternative. So just keeping things fresh, seeing if we can make a difference, you know, and try different things. So yeah, that's on the cards. I'm not sure. Emma, do you know when that is actually planned? I don't off the top of my head. No, the coming months. OK, back to the chat window. Uh, is there any scope to devise a shortened framework for smaller organisations who may not have the funding to include the full framework in every project? I can pick that one up. Um, so I think um, although we've devised the framework and we would obviously recommend that the whole thing is used, it goes without saying that we're in a really fortunate position because we have a big budget and lots of resource. So if you have smaller um, projects, less resource, less money, funding, everything like that. What we would just do is recommend you just pick up as many as you can, basically. So you could even focus on certain aspects of it. Um, any improvements that you can make are, are good improvements at the end of the day. Great. I'm going to pick this one up. I was interested in the idea of not to nudge, but would it be more cost effective to simply see if the interviewer can do the interview there and then? Yeah, so that's so we did not nudge just like a starting point because um, we had the online and the telephone versions of the questionnaire developed. We haven't yet developed a face to face version of the questionnaire. I mean, I think it would probably be based on the telephone version, but there would be some nuances to that specific version of the questionnaire. So we haven't yet got um, a, a, a version of the questionnaire that an interviewer could do there and then. So that's why we push up a knock to nudge first. Plus, we don't have a feel as of yet as to the you know that the kind of feeling and attitude towards people post covid to interviewers going into the household so that's something else we've tried to reduce you know going into households and trying to do it more by telephone and online so more like hands off approach super and um, probably the last one another one i picked up from the q a uh, it's a two in two parts Upon designing the advanced letters, do you do any split sample experiments on the on the, the tone issue in addition to the quality tests? And um, and in terms of the rearrangement of the, the flow, the sequencing, did you make any changes in question wording as well? And do you experience any uh, you know deviations in the final distributions? We didn't do any quant split on the tone. We very much were just driven by the qualitative research. We felt that like we had enough evidence from that to not need to quant test that. But, you know, by all means, others can give that a go if they don't have time to maybe do the as much in-depth qual on that. And in terms of the flow, um, yes, we did make changes to the questions. Um, we were looking at it as a sort of holistic suite of questions. So therefore, some of it did need to change. Um, and that also helped us to meet those mental models a lot better than uh, the current questions were meeting them. OK, thank you so much. We're coming up to one o'clock, so I will draw it to a close there. I'm sorry if I didn't manage to get to your uh, particular question. I will race through as many as I could. So uh, thank you once again uh, to our speakers from the Office for National Statistics for a fascinating and entertaining presentation. Uh, thank you all for your attendance. Uh, if you're available tomorrow afternoon, we have a, a European Social Survey event uh, where four of our repeat rotating modules from across the, the two decades will be presenting uh, findings from, from their work. So that's ESS Greatest Hits Volume 1, uh, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, have a great afternoon. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.